UUCR will be holding a newcomer's orientation on Saturday, October 29th. I think that's two weeks from yesterday in the sanctuary. Whether you are brand new or newish to UUCR, this is the event to attend. If you have questions about Unitarian Universalism or UUCR in general. This brief but informative event will be hosted by Reverend Scott and UCR leaders. Child care will be provided. For questions or to RSVP, RSVP contact membership co-chair Kathy DeHelianas. Cottage meetings are still going on and there are sign up sheets in the uh, foyer after service, if you haven't signed up for a cottage meeting, please do so. This is your opportunity to give feedback uh, on your hopes and desires, dreams for our new settled minister. They're on the windows. Oh, they're on the windows? Yeah, they're stuck up on the windows. Okay, thank you. And save the date. Saturday, November 12th, is UUCR's annual auction. It's our church, church's largest fundraiser, but it's also a lot of fun. After two years of virtual events, we are holding an in-person auction this year with online options so that everyone can participate. We're going to kick off the in-person event with a welcome back to UUCR dinner. So please, RSVP to today so they know how much food to get. So go to uureston.org slash auction. And the auction website is now open for donations and early bids. I was on it this weekend and there are lots of good things already, but plenty of space for more. Check it out. It takes a lot of work to put together the auction. And so if you can help in any way, please contact auction co-chair Kathy DeHelianis. And now we're going to hear from Reverend Scott. My first announcement is to reiterate that. Kathy, where are you? Kathy, stand up so people can volunteer today. She needs volunteers. And you all, you heard Kathy's name twice already today. You know she's mega volunteer, wonderful volunteer. She can't do it alone. So please, a few of you go up to her today and, and offer to help. Um, Jane, come on up. We have been active in the closet for years, and it's time for some more people to step up. Reverend Scott put it in a nutshell. We've been active in the closet for decades. It's part of our social justice, social action, participation. Uh, it's one of the key nonprofits supporting those in need in Northern Virginia. Uh, it accomplishes its mission through the closet thrift shop and it, it does vouchers. It does so many things. Um, we have a new incredible manager there. The place has changed. It's open. It's, it's a fun place to be. But the churches have just like us, people who have been moving away, getting elderly, coming back from COVID, whatever. And we have a few core people who have been working, but we need more. And I know with this Wednesday management meeting, it's gonna be made clear that the churches that are not providing volunteers will be cut from the group. And we're giving, but we need to give a whole lot more. So if you need any more details, come and see me and I want to do a shout out. Uh, Judy has been my, um, together we, we are the representatives for the closet and Barbara Burleson and I go regularly and um, Ruth Grubb has joined us and so is Kristen Newton and we need more of you. So come on over. It's a great place to give, to shop, to volunteer. Thank you. I've got lots of literature. <laughs> and you get some great clothing if you you can buy some stuff so please if you're especially retired and have a little time uh, sign up for this holly come on up our president and we're going to talk to you about the capital campaign the only cartoon that i ever saved from my childhood was ziggy standing at the bottom 
of a signpost and it said this way, that way, this way, that way. And the caption at the bottom was one of many ways. I carried that thing in my wallet and my pocket and I love that idea, one of many ways. And so is it any wonder whatsoever that I would find a home at UUCR where we appreciate one of many ways? And so I stood up here with that history and with the love of UUCR and said to you, could we please try to raise money to get rid of the building loan? Our financial advisors are telling us that this is our best path forward. I know economically it's a difficult time, but if we could capture that money and pay off that building loan, we could create a space at UUCR for generations of young individuals fighting for social justice. And we have done that. And I might get a little emotional, that we have raised a commitment of $193,000, which exceeds, which exceeds what we need. However, if you still have that commitment card and are still able to contribute that, would you please do that? Once we pay off the building loan, we've also got some maintenance issues that we need to take care of. So if we have extra money, we're gonna, I've got, um, Bruce and David Nemi putting together a list of what hasn't happened over the last two years. We did a great job with HVAC. We got the high tech stuff done, but there are some maintenance things that need to be taken care of. So we're gonna take a look at that and try and knock that out. And then we've also significantly depleted our capital fund. And so if we get extra money, we're gonna say, pay off the building loan, do some maintenance, and then replenish our capital fund. So. Lots of hugs, lots of kisses. Thank you so much. You have dug deep when you were able, and we have completed our capital fundraising campaign. And I happen to have some extra cards. They're right here in my back pocket, so all you have to do is grab me during coffee hour and say, Scott, I want a card, and you won't have to ask twice. Okay. Our prelude. Oh, she's not sorry. Now let's center ourselves for worship. Please take some deep, quieting breaths with me. Let us enter our time of worship together as we listen to We Are Called by David Haas, arranged by Mark Hayes, and performed by Diane Karsten Pellick.
In a recent Ann Landers column, a moral opinion seeker wrote and asked, what do you think of someone who lies and cheats then goes to church on Sunday and sing hymns? Ms. Landers replied that the person was in the right place. Right on, Ms. Landers. We gather in church not because we are perfect and pious and righteous beyond reproach. We gather here because we know deep to our bones that good and well-meaning as we are, we are nonetheless fragile and flawed and foibled human beings who fall short of our best selves. And so imperfect people that we are, we come to church to remind ourselves that we can always grow ourselves into better people, always grow a bigger soul, a more inclusive heart. So pure, perfect people shouldn't come to church. They just ruin the experience for the rest of us. <laughs> they cause trouble. Because this church is here for imperfect people like you and me, we're glad to see all of you. So will you look to those to your right and left and just say, welcome. Come thou font of every blessing. Good morning. Our opening hymn is number 126, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. If you are at home on Zoom, we hope you will sing along. The words will be in your chat box. And those of us here in the sanctuary, please rise in body and or spirit and join us. of every blessing tune our hearts to sing thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise while the hope of life's perfection fills our hearts with joy and love teach us Leslie Tyson, and I bring our chalice lighting this morning. This comes from Rainer Maria Rilke, from his letters to a young poet, dated August 12, 1904. The work being accomplished within you. So don't be frightened, dear friend, if a sadness confronts you larger than any you have ever known, casting a shadow over all you do. You must think something is happening within you. 
and remember that life has not forgotten you. It holds you in its hand and will not let you fall. Why would you want to exclude from your life any uneasiness, doubt, or disconcern, since you know what work they are accomplishing within you? morning. Now is the time for all ages. This morning, I should be in Birmingham, Alabama, with liberal religious educators from across the U.S. and Canada. But I am so happy to also be with you here right now through the magic of AV. Our story today is called Not My Problem. And that's your line. So repeat after me, not my problem. That is a great start. Watch for me to gesture towards you. And when I do, say your line with me, not my problem. Wonderful. Once upon a time, there was a queen who was sitting on the balcony of her palace, eating rice cakes and honey with her chief advisor. They were watching what was happening in the busy street below them. And the queen pointed to something. As she did, honey dropped off of her rice cake onto the balcony railing. Her advisor saw this and said, my queen, you have spilled a drop of honey. Shall I call a servant to come and clean it up? But the queen laughed and said, Oh, a little drop of honey is not my problem. Someone will clean it later. They went on eating and talking as the drop of honey warmed in the sunlight and it slowly dripped down the railing until it fell into the street with a plop. The advisor said, Your Highness, that drop of honey has now fallen into the street where it's attracting flies. Shouldn't I call a servant to come and clean it up? But again, the queen yawned lazily and replied, Oh, a little drop of honey and a few flies is not my problem. Someone will deal with it later. Soon, a lizard darted out from beneath the palace wall and began to catch the flies on her tongue. Then, a cat sprang from the baker's shop and began to bat the lizard back and forth like a toy. Just then, a dog charged out from the butcher shop and began to bite the cat on the neck. Your Highness, the advisor implored, now the flies have attracted a lizard, which attracted a cat, which is now being attacked by a dog. Shouldn't we call someone to stop the fight? But the queen only stretched and shook her head at her advisor and said, Oh, won't you relax? The silly animal fight is 
not my problem. Someone will surely see to it. In fact, the baker did see to it. She saw the dog attacking her cat, and she ran out with her rolling pin and began to hit the dog with it, which is not something no one here would ever do, right? And then the butcher heard his dog howling and ran out with his broom and began to hit the dog. Soon the butcher and the baker were hitting each other. Then the neighboring shopkeepers began to take sides, joining in the fight. Then some soldiers came along, but some knew the baker and some knew the butcher, and so they took sides and joined in the fight. And the battle grew and it grew and it grew until there was a great battle waging in the streets. People were throwing rocks through windows and tipping over the vendor's carts. Someone picked up a torch from the wall and hurled it through a window. Fire raged and eventually it spread to the palace. Before they knew it, the queen and her advisor were being escorted down a ladder from the balcony into the street below because the palace itself was in flames. Later that day, when the fire had died out, the queen and her advisor surveyed the ruins of their land. Suddenly, the queen stopped in the street underneath where her balcony had been. She reached down and touched something in a small puddle on the ground. It's honey, she said. I guess I should have cleaned up that drop of honey in the first place. Now my whole kingdom has been lost because of it. That was the very last day the queen ever said, it's not my problem. I wonder what we might learn from this story and the sermon and religious education today. Children and teens, if they like, may now go downstairs to do a social justice project. Let us sing them out with Go With Joy. The lyrics will be projected here. is the time in our service when we share our joys and concerns with one another so that no one has to hold them alone. If you are joining us remotely this morning, as about 40 to 50 households are, you may wish to light a virtual or real candle wherever you are to mark what is on your heart. As members of the gathered congregation, those who wish to come forward and take a stone for every joy or sorrow or concern they have and place it in the bowl, which holds so much of our love and concern. And they can also take a stone from around the, the vase to remind them this week of what they are, what is on their heart. And those of you at home, if you would like to write in the chat on Zoom your joy or concern, please do so. But remember that that will become public. So now as our music is played, may our ritual of joys and concerns begin.
Let us be one with one another now in spirit and affection. Spirit of life and love that so faithfully animates this creation, we are grateful for this community that is with us in both times of joy and sorrow. And we hold in our hearts this hour all who are facing any hardship or difficulty, grieving, facing loss, illness, disability in themselves or those around them. In particular this morning, I'd have your attentions go out to Linda Holloway, who fell on the Lake Anna Plaza and broke her wrist. I believe she's having surgery to repair that wrist tomorrow or Tuesday, and she's in some discomfort. Please hold her in your thoughts. Whether shared here this morning or held silently in our hearts, may, all, may our joys be multiplied in community and may all gathered here find comfort and calm and peace this hour. As a self-funded church, UUCR relies on the generosity of its members and friends to find, fund daily operations and to ensure that the church and its resources are here for us and others now and in the future. Pledges support our worship and music programs, our religious education program, programs for members and friends, community outreach, and connections to Unitarian Universalism. We now invite you to support the work of UU Reston by making your donation to the collection plate if you are here in the sanctuary or at the link on the slide and in the chat box. Thank you for your generosity and support of our beloved spiritual home. So this morning I continue my 2022 autumn sermon series, The Five Smooth Stones of Liberalism, inspired by the work of the Reverend Dr. James Luther Adams, who was a teacher and minister who, after he abandoned his fundamentalist Baptist background, became a longtime divinity school professor at Harvard and is widely recognized, as Wikipedia puts it as, quote, the most influential theologian among American Unitarian Universalists in the 20th century. Jim, as he was known to his friends and colleagues, was a brilliant, kind, and gentle man who wrote widely about UUism and thought and practice in his best remembered book uh, on being human religiously. 
And in this book, the Reverend Max Stackhouse, his editor, lays out uh, the essence of James Luther Adams' thinking in the nomenclature of the five smooth stones, which I, I have up here. Um, and as I have mentioned in the first three sermons, this image of five stones comes from a rather violent story, the a story of David and Goliath, when the Philistine army and the Israeli army were facing each other centuries ago. It was David who killed the nine foot giant Goliath by picking up five smooth stones from a riverbed. And even though he was a 97 pound weakling, he slayed Goliath and it's a famous story you all know. So what Stackhouse was very subtly implying is that in our battle against religious orthodoxy, we have five smooth stones that will slay, if you will, the our best weapon against orthodox thinking. It's, it's got a, quite an edge to it, this image. And uh, so we have, uh, I'd like to put up the next slide to show you what these five stones are and just uh, basically recite them. On September 18th, I preached about learn. Our idea that revelation is unsealed and we must always, as a religious people, be learning new truths. Then on October 2nd, I talked about respect, which is James Luther Adams' idea that we must be in right relationship with one another in religious community with no with free consent and no coercion or authoritarianism in our religion. Then last Sunday, I preached his idea about give. We are morally obligated to seek and work for a just and loving community and world. We must be each of us a prophetic voice in society for the greater good. And today's topic work. And by this, he means there is no immaculate conception of virtue. We affirm instead the necessity of social incarnation. That is to say, it is people who must make good things happen. They don't just miraculously happen. Good must be consciously given form and power within history and society. And then in two weeks, I'm gonna conclude the series, hopefully with hope, we must strive for an attitude of ultimate optimism, Adams says, we must live in hope. But we're focusing our attention on the fourth stone, and that is work. Asserts the theological proposition that only imperfect people can make our world a more loving and just and peaceful place. I'd like to begin with the actual words of James Luther Adams himself, and hang with me here, folks, because his articulation of this fourth stone and what it means gets a little theologically esoteric and complex. We're going to project that quote up. Dr. James Luther Adams said thus, we are led to the fourth element, the fourth stone of liberalism. We deny the immaculate conception of virtue and affirm the necessity of social incarnation. There is no such thing, he writes, as goodness as such, except in a limited sense. The decisive forms of goodness in society are institutional forms. The faith of the liberal must express itself in societal forms, institutional forms, in the forms of education, in economic and social organization, and in political organization. Without these, freedom and justice in community are impossible. So let's unpack this very tight paragraph and try to get at what Adams really means by all this. The Reverend Thomas per Perchick, a minister of our shoreline UU Church in Seattle, reflecting on this stone, says this. We could project the next slide. Well. I'll just, there he is, that's Thomas, a friend of mine. He says, with the fourth smooth stone, Adam insists that when it comes to human persons and behavior, there is no immaculate conception, which means that there are no perfect actions, just as there are no perfect people. We have to accept that no act 
is perfectly virtuous. We cannot avoid the lack of perfection or purity in human living. But nonetheless, what lies at the center of our Unitarian Universalist theology is that notwithstanding human imperfection, what matters most in religion are good and compassionate human choices, good and compassionate human actions, and working to create greater justice within human societies. To be good religiously, he goes on, requires the manifestation of goodness in the creation of community, society, and civilization. And then he ends, thus goodness must be part of making history, and it can thus never be pure and free of mistakes, the mess and the difficulties of being human. So here, dare I say in simpler language, is what I think Adams is trying to say to us. Because we human beings, we naturally, because we are human beings, we naturally want a good and just society. And yet people and their decisions and their institutions are perfectly imperfect. And we will always fall short of our goals in some way or another. But lying at the very center of our liberal faith is the idea that notwithstanding human imperfection, what matters most is that we constantly, constantly work at making good and better human decisions and just and loving actions, thereby slowly building better communities, better societies, and better civilizations. And then I think what he was also saying is that, and we cannot look to God or Jesus or any other external perfect supernatural entity to make our world better and more humane and a more peaceful place. We are the only ones out of our messy and imperfect humanity in the scramble of human history of which we are a part, we are the only ones who can slowly save and humanize the world. So with this fourth stone of religious liberalism, Adams is making an almost purely humanist and activist argument. It is imperfect people like us who by the quality of our principles and commitments must bring love and justice to the structures and the organization of human institutions and societies. You and I cannot wait for God or Jesus or anyone else to make the world right. We have to dive into the mess, the eternal mess of human existence and do the best we can in a terribly broken world. And Jane, we talked about this yesterday morning at the coffee about you know how imperfect, uh, you, we all wanna fix it. We all individually wanna fix it. And I said to you and others, not to, not to happen exactly. So Christians, um, it's almost as if Adams was saying to the Christians who were waiting for Jesus to return to earth and make everything right, hey folks, I got news for you. Jesus is not coming back. And no all powerful supernatural God is going to intervene either and make everything right. So for God's sake and yours, roll up your sleeves and get busy building a just and loving world. Recently, when I was biking in Vero Beach, Florida, uh, down that's the, that is old, old Dixie Highway, which I hope they change the name of that old Dixie Highway pretty soon, the Riverside Baptist Church had this sign up earlier this month. Jesus may come at any moment. Are you ready? <clears throat> what James Luther Adams, I had to stop and take a picture of that sign. Uh, what Adams is saying is, that's the wrong question. It's not Jesus or some other supernatural being who's going to do the work of ultimately saving our world. It's you and me, so let's get busy. Jesus is not coming back. Let's get busy. This is precisely what Unitarian Universals have been since the er doing since the earliest days of our religious movement. The Reverend, I quoted this before, the Reverend Bill Schultz said, ours and is a religion, ours is a theology of dirty hands. Now, some of you new to our congregation may not know 
that since the earliest days of America, many of the greatest advocates for structural, structural social justice and reform, and don't get this mixed up with uh, individual things, m many of the, the, the biggest social reformers of institutions have been Unitarians or Universalists. And I just wanna give you a quick roll call of some of the noteworthy UUs who have nobly lived out this theology of dirty hands that Schultz talked about. Let's begin with Theodore Parker and William Ellery Channing, you Unitarian ministers who fought hard in the public square to end slavery in America. And Theodore Parker, you see him with the wild hair, he kept a loaded gun in his home office because he had freed slaves in his home and he kept that gun at the ready to shoot any slave uh, captors who might come to his home. He also kept a sword in the pulpit. I don't have one here this morning. Just in case any slave catchers came by the church on Sunday morning to take some of the freed slaves who were in the congregation. This was not a wimpy faith. Next, Benjamin Rush and Dorothea Dix. Two 20th century pioneers who led the way in American penal and mental health reform, insisting on, you know, the early prisons and, and mental institutions were horrible places. And these two people and many other Unitarians and Universalists fought for humane treatment for all. Then there was Horace Mann and Elizabeth Peabody. Horace Mann, the father of American public education for all children, and Elizabeth Peabody, who founded the first kindergarten. Notice how I said that, Peabody? Peabody? I had a parishioner in my first church, uh, Mary Peabody, and she was very insistent. It was Peabody, in any case. Uh, and you said Peabody at the risk of your life. And she was in a wheelchair and 90 years old, and don't mess with, uh, God bless, I haven't thought of her for years. Elizabeth Peabody, who founded the first kindergarten for early childhood development then, it was Joseph Tuckerman and Margaret Fuller, Unitarians who helped create the modern social welfare system as we know it, and governmental protections for the downtrodden and the poor. Then there was Henry Berg and Samuel Gridley Howe, who pioneered care, uh, Gridley Howe, who uh, pioneered care and education for the blind, and Henry Berg founded both the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals and a similar organization to protect children from child labor. The ASPCA, when you get a fundraising appeal that has Unitarian roots. Then there was Florence Nightingale, Albert Schweitzer, and Clara Barton, all three of whom pioneered compassionate nursing care for all the victims of war. Albert Schweitzer, who was originally a Lutheran, but accepted membership in the Church of the Larger Fellowship, which I served for 10 years, brought medical care, as you all know, to the people of, the, of uh, Africa, uh, and uh, just a great man. Then there was Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who fought tirelessly for decades for equal rights and protection and voting for women. And finally, from this century, and this is just a small smattering, did you know Paul Newman, Unitarian, who has given away $570 million to charity before his death. His, his nonprofit company still produces millions each year. Newman's Own, next time you buy Newman's Own, you know it has a Unitarian structural good roots. And Christopher Reeves, Superman, along with his wife Dana, they both, all these people belong to one of our churches, Westport, Connecticut, who after his tragic equestrian accident, founded the Christopher and Dana Reeves Foundation, which funds spinal cord research and devotes itself to improving the quality of life for all physically paralyzed or handicapped persons. All of these noble ind individuals and countless more from our 500 years of history represent what Adams is talking about, the Unitarian Universalist legacy of social reform, structural reform, the kind of work that Adams is calling us to do, and the kind of social and human service 
to this day which animates our religious movement. And we have much more work to do, and we'll get to that in a minute. Let me tell one more story about a Unitarian Universalist who worked to make a real difference in our world. And it's one that I personally am very proud of. Back in the early 2000s, when I was senior minister over in Bethesda at River Road during the Bush administration, that administration spearheaded by then Vice President Dick Cheney instituted, as you know, a policy of torturing prisoners we captured during the Afghan war to get information out of them. One of the members of, my con of that congregation, Linda Gostaitis, there she is testifying before Congress, who was a Senate, Senate staffer familiar with the particulars of the war in Afghanistan, came to me one day for a cup of coffee and she said, Scott, I am heartsick that my government, ignoring the longstanding rules of war established by the Geneva Convention and the principles of dignity upon which our nation was founded, I'm terrified by my government engaging in torture on my behalf as an American, and I wanna do something to stop it. Well, I, as we talked about it, I too, of course, shared her conviction that this policy of torture was unacceptable. It not only violates the rules of war and the best instincts of the American dream, it also violates that first principle of ours, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. So after we talked about it for a little while, we, we, the River Road Church is less than two miles from the Naval Observatory where the Vice President lives. So we decided we just gather a few of our friends and on Wednesday at five o'clock, and I, because of my bike route home to, to the city, I knew that the Cheney motorcade always came up Massachusetts Avenue, usually between five and 5.30. We spread ourselves out along Massachusetts Avenue to the gate where he would turn in. So he had to see us with our placards and our signs saying, and torture. And we started out with about 40 people and then it grew to 80 people and then it grew to 120 people, and we stretched further and further out. We got some media coverage, and the first few times that Cheney went by, uh, you can never see in the smoked glass of the limousine, so we didn't really know if he was taking it all in. But pretty soon, he started coming in the other entrance on Wednesday nights to avoid seeing us and avoid hearing us. And hundreds of motorists would honk and blast as in cheerful tones of support for us. And we did this for weeks. And then coming out of that, a small group of people decided to, uh, next picture please, decided to form an organization, the National Religious Coalition Campaign Against Torture, which all began because Linda came to my office and said, I can't stand it. I've got to do something. This little tiny, protest and by the way it was not just river road people it grew to be so we had catholic nuns and um, jewish members and we, we get, it became an interfaith thing very quickly and this organization still has offices in washington has a paid staff we got a grant from the ford foundation it still exists and as you know when the obama administration came in torture was banned in the United States. So never, never doubt the power of, uh, of things that you do, which may seem so inconsequential at first. These little protests we had, we never really thought it would turn into as much and to an effective movement as it did. You have to work. You have to work for a better society. And even though I'm only uh, to be with you for these two years here, here on an interim basis, I want to tell you that I'm very proud to serve this congregation, which does take this moral responsibility to work with others of goodwill to institutionally transform our society and our world into a better place. And you all know the kinds of things we do with refugees and and with the closet, we work on a number of levels. We, we, we're not doing enough. As we come out of COVID, we need to get more volunteers. We need to have more events. We're having an anti-racism workshop in three Saturdays. You can sign up for that. Uh, we need to do more. So 
final slide. My message to you this morning, my message to you this morning, there it is. Jesus isn't coming. Jesus isn't coming. So get busy. I once saw this bumper sticker on a UU car. Um, and by the way, the right wing uh, religion, some, some, um, I've seen also a, a whimsical bumper sticker, Jesus is coming, so look busy. But that's not my message to you this morning. The only way we're going to ever see anything resembling a just and humane social order is if we imperfect actors as we are in the world cannot rely on the immaculate conception of goodness just simply arising out of nothing or arising from some supernatural force. The only way it's going to happen is if we as imperfect people roll up our sleeves and get busy. Yes, we're going to make many mistakes along the way. Yes, we're going to be constantly frustrated as we were having coffee with all these problems of society and all this evil and darkness of Trumpism and other things are seem to be crushing in on us. We have to keep pushing against the tide and work and work and work again. Let me say it one last time. Jesus isn't coming. Let's get busy. Amen. We'll build a land. Our closing hymn is number 121, We'll Build a Land. Please rise in body or spirit and join us in singing.
where like oaks of righteousness stand her people. So I am sure that more than one of you left a spouse in bed or with the Washington Post, and you're going to come in the door, and they're going to say, "Hun, what did you learn in church this morning? And you're going to say simply, I learned, repeat after me, Jesus isn't coming, so let's get busy. My God, I think they've got it. We extinguish this flame. But not the light of truth, the warmth of community, the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. For our postlude today, the choir is going to sing a song called Be the Change by Laura Farnell. Um, I wanted to point out that it begins with some text in Swahili. It starts with Basi Mwanga Wako Uan Gaze, which means let your light shine.
<laughs> we invite our congregants attending worship on Zoom to join us for our virtual Greet Your Neighbor Coffee Hour today to discuss the service theme and enjoy fellowship with other congregants. The link is in your chat box and we will be on a forthcoming slide. Those here are invited to join us for coffee or tea and fellowship and some wonderful sweets uh, out in the foyer. And we hope you will use the, also use the chat box as a virtual receiving line to leave a message about your appreciation for today's service. <clears throat> and we're going to leave the chairs set up as they were at the beginning of the service. Do not stack them. Have a good day. <laughs>